Good afternoon, everyone who's joining us. And welcome to the first segment of our advice session. And we're going to be talking about the skills and tips that you need to get and get a job in international trade. And with me today, I've got an outstanding panel of three incredible speakers with a wealth of experience, having worked in the trade sector in multiple roles. So just to get us started, um, the intention of this session is to basically make sure that we are giving a very practical perspective and practical tips to our audience online, who are then going to be, you know, sort of going away knowing that they have a roadmap or knowing the next steps that they're going to make in terms of looking for work. So we're going to sort of put on our glasses and imagine you know, ourselves as students again, just that the context is the present moment and we're trying to get a job in the, you know, in the current world. Um, and just to remind our online audience, uh, we have a Q&A box. So right from the beginning, I'm going to request you to post your questions in the Q&A box. And I'm going to um, have a look at those questions as our session uh, continues, yeah. So to get us started, I'm going to start with the only man in the panel, the distinguished man. <laughs> and George, um, could you please introduce yourself and tell us, when you're looking at a pile of 300 applications that have been submitted for a job that you put out, what are some of the things that jump at you as someone who's looking for a candidate in terms of the CV and in terms of the cover letter. Thank you. And it's it's a real pleasure to be here and, and talking about this. So in who am I to start with? Uh, so my name is George Riddell. I'm a director of trade strategy at EY based in London. Um, about three years ago, we set up a new trade advisory team, um, really with the idea to help clients um, improve how they trade around the world from a very practical and operational perspective. Um, worked in a number of different trade roles um, over the course of my career, um, starting out um, as a, at a think tank, um, doing research into trade and environmental issues before moving to the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as it was at the time, um, and ended up as a uh, diplomat representing the UK um, at the World Trade Organization um, over the course of the Brexit period. So it was quite an interesting role before moving into the private sector. So th this is actually a situation that happened recently um, as we were expanding my team um, from, from originally two people and, and now we're 15 people, um, put out the uh, call to, to get some new um, colleagues to, to join the team and, and got 300 applications, which is quite a lot of work to, to sift through that. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a couple of things that really make um, applications stand out. One um, is formatting. I think, you know, it's very basic, but but making sure that your most relevant experience to the job is right up top so that the person, when they're opening the document or, or reading through the application, mm -hmm. is able to, to get the necessary information as quickly as, as they can. Um, the second is really around tailoring um, the application to, to the job, um, making sure that you've really, um, really thought about what you, you're bringing to the, to the team. Um, and also, you know, that you've looked through sort of the recent work of the team um, and, and sort of tailored it, uh, you know, even if you don't agree with everything and said, oh, well, do, I wouldn't have written in the article this way because I think you've forgotten that. It just shows that you're taking the time in order to um, make sure that you're giving the most visibility you can mm. as to what you're bringing to, to that role. And I think that's really something a lot of people miss out. When you're joining a team, you may be a wonderful person and, and you know, most people are, mm. but as a recruiter, what you're thinking is I've got skills gaps within my team. Okay. I need to be filling those. So how and who can I get in order to do that and, and you know, really expand the work that we're doing? Excellent. Oh, thanks so much, uh, George. Um, I think you touched on quite a number of interesting points, which we, we're going to go deeper into later on. And um, our next speaker is Katrona. Katrona, could you please uh, introduce yourself and just sort of bring us into your world? You know, you're working a lot on the future of work. So, you know, when you think of the future of work, 
what are sort of some of the skills, you know, that candidates need to prepare themselves, need to equip themselves with as they think of the future of work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm not uh, right in the core of trade as, our, as my fellow distinguished panelists are, but delighted to be sitting within the Center for Trade and Economic Integration here in the Graduate Institute. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Thinking Ahead on Societal Change, or the TASC platform, um, and we focus on bringing together uh, multilateral institutions and the diverse uh, organizations that exist here across sectors in places like International Geneva that are working together on large-scale societal transformations. Um, and for the first two years of the TASC platform's existence, we've been uh, really driving in on this uh, issue of the future of work. Um, so when it comes to preparing for the future, what we really hear are a shift in what people are looking for in terms of skill sets. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for a job in trade, then of course there's that expert knowledge on trade, um, what trade looks like now, what trade will look like and how it will change in the future. Um, but there are two key areas that, that I was speaking to George about just before we started <laughs> um, that are uh, really the focus on technology. We know technology is changing incredibly fast. Um, so there's an awareness of technology as it stands now, but also the direction that it could flow in. So staying on top of tech skills and having some sort of tech specialism or enough tech savvy to be able to navigate uh, the shifts in technology and the implications of those are incredibly valuable. The second area, which has grown hugely, um, in my career is the area of sustainability mm -hmm. um, and that covers environmental and social sustainability and increasingly the subject of resilience mm -hmm. uh, in terms of supply chain resilience, business resilience. Um, so finding your footing in that space um, can really help you to address a whole set of issues that are hitting the, the trade agenda and will rise in the trade agenda in the future. Um, my third skill set to focus on um, across those would be the shift from hard skills to soft skills. We're talking about technology. Many tasks as we move forward will be automated, easy tasks, administrative tasks, yeah. not only for, uh, um, we think of automation in terms of factory automation, but increasingly white collar automation is happening in jobs and jobs are segmented. Um, so the soft skills, the human skills, things that AI will not be able to do are incredibly valuable. So being able to bring that across the ability to deal with clients, the ability to navigate complex spaces um, will be increasingly important for the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katrona. And last but not least, we've got Rivka Jaffe joining us all the way from New York. Good morning, Rivka. So lovely to see you. <laughs> good, good morning, Joan. Good morning, fellow panel members. Thanks for having me. Um, and good afternoon to, to Geneva and, and the rest of Europe. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, and I know you're not a stranger to Geneva. I mean, working for the ITC, uh, I'm guessing that you've been here several times. So Rika, could you uh, introduce yourself, please, and just, you know, tell us what, um, what the ITC does and sort of the skills and experiences you'd recommend um, for someone to, to have before they get into the ITC? Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, I've been uh, with the ITC for, for 13 years and I'm very familiar with Geneva. In fact, seven of those years were in Geneva. So, you know, la, uh, you know the, the, the drinks at the terrasse and Van de Paqui are two of my favorite spots. So, um, but I mean, the International Trade Center, I think, especially for a lot of uh, the, the students that, that would be online, uh, would not be, um, you wouldn't be a stranger to this. So ITC, uh, we are the, the international agency agency, um, joint agency of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization. And what we're about is about making international trade work for small and medium enterprises from developing countries. So if you think about the multilateral architecture of international trade, you've got the World Trade Organization, which is all about the rules of the game um, for international trade. You've got UNCTAD, um, which is all about um, supporting developing countries to make policies within those rules so that they can benefit from trade for development. And ITC is more the practical side of um, making trade work. So it's uh, it's all about 
then okay so um having uh, uh, access to intelligence um for so that uh, smes can take business decisions um of you know what markets want what standards are there what non-tariff measures uh, um, are, are around and you know uh, what katrona has talked about about sustainability and technology that's all new areas as well for us um it's where about strengthening the ecosystem of institutions that support those um those small businesses in developing countries and we we help policymakers to to make policy decisions that support small businesses to to do international trade um my career in trade actually predates that um my time in itc so um i actually started my career um in my home country of south africa where I, um, I worked for a traded investment promotion agency starting um, in the space of as, as a trade economist. So really doing market analysis, really, you know, trying to help um, uh, mainly exporters, but also investors take informed decisions um, using, and I was actually a client of ITC using their data. And then I moved over to the strategy side um, of, for, for the same organization. Um, uh, and, uh, and a few other things. And then I eventually ended up at, at ITC. In terms of the, the practical side of, um, of job applications and um, wanting to start a career in this space, I think it's important to also think about, you know, what are you interested in in trade? There's, you know, the hard nuts and bolts of trade. Are you interested in global logistics? Are you interested in the flow, like how trade works? actually, then, you know, that's a, a particular set of companies uh, or institutions that you would you would be um, interested in, in going for. Are you interested in the normative work, the rules, the law, um, the stuff that, you know, that, that governs trade, then of course, um, multilateral organizations would be the place. Or are you interested in trade and development? And I'm asking the question about you, because I really firmly believe in marrying your skill set, like what you do well, what you're, um, what you've trained to do, um, your interests and what you're passionate about. So it, it really comes through when you, you know, I read hundreds of applications and I know when you're starting out, I started as an intern back in the day, you know, and, um, you're applying to so many things. It's very competitive out there. But it comes across when people are just doing a pro forma cut and paste if they haven't, you know, uh, if they haven't tailored it. And um, if they're not really, you know, if you want to, to form a path, start a path somewhere, it does help if you're really interested in, um, uh, in the work and you're passionate about it. I'll give you one example from my own career. I, I mentioned this to Joan um, uh, when we had our chat. Um, after I started in my trade and investment promotion agency back home, my next job was actually working on the 2010 FIFA World Cup. You'd say, what's that got to do with trade? And I got a directorship position in my government and, and the, my competition were all people who were working, who came from a sports background, sports management, sport and development, um, football, um, I had no experience in that area, but for me, what was very clear, this job was about project management, communication, um, and uh, trying to have a positive economic legacy from a mega event. For me, uh, the FIFA World Cup is a, an export of services. We're talking about tourism, we're talking about events, um, and it's about um, how uh, to get, you know, the most out of this of this event for the benefit of, of people and and it, it is an export of service so using those arguments and using the skills that i developed earlier and also i had an interest in, in football i used to play soccer you know and it kind of all came together um and i think it's important to 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 marry those things um and my final point would be if you're interested in trade it's not just about a siloed approach anymore of um, trade on its own, just the, 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 the export and import of goods and services. Um, the agenda really is trade and, going back to uh, what Katrona said also, that, you know, for me, in my job right now, representing ITC in New York in an agenda which is so full 
often, uh, you know, here in New York um, at the United Nations, we have peace and security issues discussed. It's human rights. It's it's such a broad agenda, and we need to find the intersection of trade and these issues, and um, how trade can be a positive influence, how trade can be an engine for sustainable development, as it says in, in, you know, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it's trade and gender, trade and, um, you know, uh, climate change, trade and biodiversity, trade and digital connectivity, because connectivity is not enough if you have access, but it doesn't lead to economic opportunity. So I would say this also ties into this point of your passion, you know, so, it helps that trade is broader because it could also you ask yourself, what am I what am I passionate about? Anyway, I'm going on too long. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Rivka. And I feel like the whole um, idea or or you know the, the the intersection of trade with other topics keeps coming up. And I'd like us to kind of go a little bit deeper into this. And I'm turning to you, Katrona, because also um, you talked a bit about this. And George, you're welcome also to comment on this. But I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of candidates tend to have sort of like a broad background. Let's say they've studied international relations and they want to get into trade. So how can they, you know, marry whatever profile they have? Because I feel like if we're talking about the intersection of trade with other issues, maybe someone might have studied gender and they want to get into trade. So how can they marry, you know, their current profiles because it's opening up? with the trade world like how can they you know sort of use that as an entry point yeah um i think there's there's two ways that they can look at this the first is to look for jobs that are specifically focused on that intersection or to use that as an, an entry point the top hat line to your cv i'm interested in gender and trade because of my work at xyz mm. and really highlight that element in your in your career um, and really focus on what's going on around you and follow those discussions and debates. There's so much public material, so many public events in the, the trade space mm -hmm. uh, that you can really look at what's on the cutting edge of that intersection uh, and, and watch how you and your passions could contribute to that space. Um, the second way is in generalist skills, cross-cutting skills. I've always seen myself as a, a generalist. You have a few expert areas but really your if your ability is in uh, are in project management in communications in bringing people together um, I worked a lot in cross-sector multi-sector collaboration um, then these really fall into these and areas as well because they're spaces where you're doing that translation work where you're bringing people together who aren't normally are necessarily used to working together mm -hmm. um, and where you're exploring new ground. So any skills that you have that contribute to creative thinking, to new analysis, to uh, exploring new space, to bringing people together, to communicating clearly, um, all these things can be incredibly valuable. And it's looking at that specialist uh, skill set you have, those cross-cutting interests you have, uh, and those cross-cutting skills mm -hmm. that you have um and and bringing those together in the most effective clearest way that you can um, and what george said is so important that you have you have all these passions that you want to bring across mm -hmm. in your cv and in your cover letter but really that entry point is more about the job and the team that you're joining than you yourself so tailor it tailor it tailor it and if you're passionate about the organization then embed yourself in the world that you're going in mm -hmm. and write your letter for that job because that's what will make you stand out amongst the pile of uh, of cut and pastes that we so often read. Okay. I think I'd add just one thing to that and, and completely agree. I think trade, coming back to sort of trade, often in Geneva we think of trade as the WTO, ITC, UNCTAD, a little bit of UNEC and some of the related think tanks. Um, the world of trade is so much broader than that and I really would encourage you to to look at that, you know, if, if we think about companies, um, before you would have supply chain managers, and they were really just mostly about logistics of getting products in the supply chain from A to B and then to the final consumer and, and retail shop. Mm -hmm. Now those supply chain managers are being asked to look at forced labor, sustainability standards, um, you know, due diligence, deforestation regulation. The regulatory agenda around trade and supply chains is changing so quickly mm -hmm. that there are huge opportunities um, 
to, to join companies and have a real impact that goes beyond sort of the, some of the more policy related discussions that, that you have in here in Geneva. All right, excellent. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, what you've mentioned, George, also, you know, identifying that gap in the team and focusing on that gap. Um, where should candidates be looking at? I'm, I mean, I'm guessing that, you know, they're going to look at the job description, yeah, to sort of try and identify that gap. But what should they be looking at in that job description when they're looking to find that gap? So I would say ask people, um, you know, through LinkedIn, through the internet, um, Twitter, you can, you know, everyone is now contactable. Um, doesn't mean that people are going to reply. Um, it, the worst thing is someone says no, but ask them for a virtual coffee. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important not just to say, you know, I want a job, which you can do, but it's I saw that you wrote this and I'm really interested in learning more about why you took that approach. And quite often people love talking about themselves, if we're honest. So, you know, that it's a great way to start that conversation. And then you can ask, oh, do you know if there are any jobs going? And people can then introduce you if, if you've had a good conversation and they think that you'd be right for something. So I definitely encourage not just applying for jobs, mm -hmm. but also trying to build your network as you as you start your career. Okay. Let's stay on that a little bit. Um, because I know that George, you and I had a little bit of a discussion about this. You know, when you're talking about candidates going also for networking events um, and then them having to prepare a kind of pitch, you know, to present themselves. Um, can you can you imagine or can you remember sort of like a pitch that captivated you and what what was what was in that pitch, you know, if you if you can remember one? So I think definitely um, coming back to, to a couple of the points that have been made, passion is is definitely infectious when people really do enjoy what they're talking about and why they're doing it i think that really does come across so so making sure that that you are passionate about what you're what you're pitching mm -hmm. i think also it coming back to the point of you know sort of what skill set does the person need or a team need and then trying to think about how what you're pitching fits into that. So definitely giving it some thought beforehand, but also as the conversation evolves, making sure that you're adapting um, what you're saying and, and how you're saying it. Awesome, excellent. Rifka, I saw you at some point smiling. It looked like you wanted to jump in on something. Is there a particular, is there something you'd like to, to jump in on? Oh, I, I actually, could, I don't know at what point I was smiling. I feel like I was nodding for most of what my, my co-founders were saying. Okay. Um, I don't know, yeah, I don't okay. have anything particular to add right now. <laughs> no problem. But um, I'd like to actually move over to you because you start, you, you mentioned that you started at ITC, you know, having done an internship and internships, I think, remain sort of one of the ways that a lot of people think of getting into the trade sector. But, you know, let's talk about, or can you, can you tell us about how do you, when you, when you start as an intern, how can you transform, move it to become a job? And then, you know, you can talk to us also about people who've been stuck in cycles of just doing one internship after the other. How can they break out of that cycle? So those two questions. Okay. Uh, so just for clarity, I actually did my first internship in South Africa. So mm -hmm. not in, not in Geneva. And I do, I mean, for people who can afford to do unpaid internships in Geneva, my hat goes off to you. But I tell you, when I did my, my degrees, there was no way I would have been able to do that. So, I mean, um, how to get into internships, how to, and, um, I think a lot of these points also, um, you know that it, it's relevant for internships as well so um what was raised before um so f if you're interested in in the multilateral organizations internships are the clearest way for um f for new for people starting out in their careers to enter an organization um it is very challenging and you know um you can have your opinion about about it it's it, it's rough being able to work for free for a few months, you know, it's anyway, like, let me move off that point. But um, so the like, um, 
starting as an intern, I think it is a great opportunity also to take some risks and to, to marry and to do exactly what we were talking about in terms of marrying your passions and your skills um, and tailoring it, tailoring your application to um, uh, to the organization you're, you're applying for. So I will put in the chat um, ITC's um, internship application um, portal. I know that, you know, the WTO, UNCTAD, others also have. But I also want to encourage people to not only focus on those three organizations. Um, there are, you know, uh, trade practices in, in the World Bank, for example. There are trade practices. You can do internships in the countries that you're from. And I would say that if you're interested in a career in the multilateral space, it also is extremely valuable if you come with experience and expertise that you've honed in a country somewhere or in the private sector, you've had work experience in a particular area and then come through. So some of the, the interns that have really shone for me, for instance, who I'm still in touch with, people who have great careers now since having an internship with me, um, are people who've, you know, they've had a career change. So uh, somebody who, she she didn't have a trade background, but she hasn't, um, her expertise was in communication. So being able to, um, to, you know, decipher information, to share it in the best way possible with different kinds of audiences. This is important in trade as well. And she was able to really sell to me that these were the skills that she had. And because our job is about building relationships also, um, you know, th uh, that really stood out. So um, I would say, you know, uh, definitely that's one part. So, in, but in terms of your question of how to not be in a cycle of, of one internship to the next, um, ask lots of questions before. So I try to be very clear when I hire interns about what opportunities there are, because I know people, you know, you want a job afterwards, you want to be paid, of course. Um, ask questions, um, you know, through LinkedIn or th through other people in an organization about the growth of a team, what, um, you know, what's their project portfolio, for example, what are the positions that are currently there that will help to give you a sense. But also, I think sometimes we get fixated that there's only one way and the only way I'm going to do trade is if I'm going to be in ITC, if I'm going to be in WTO or whatever. It, it does help if you enter those organizations, having done an internship with your ministry having done um, some work with your trade promotion organization, having done some work at DHL or with e-commerce platforms. I mean, those are skill sets that we don't necessarily have internally because they're moving so fast. Um, so uh, I think, um, yeah, people who are willing to, um, to move around to try different things um, and uh, yeah, getting out of the site. I think also, you know, it's very important. I don't know if you get a class on this when you're at the Graduate Institute or anywhere else, but you know, there are risks associated with joining the UN, for example, at, a, at too young an age, because you can get trapped into this, you know, you go from one internship to the next, and then you might go to consultancies. And um, it does help to, to go somewhere else and then come and, and maybe then leave and come back. Like I've seen that in my career, starting as a mid-career professional in the UN. Um, but we've also had um, experiences of, of young, bright people coming as interns and doing wonderful things and then growing. But it is a, a slower moving um, machine. Mm -hmm. So you have to bear with us in that. So um, yeah, do your research on the teams. Um, Try to focus on new areas because uh, that generally means growth uh, and try not to be fixated only on the one organization, um, you know, uh, because many, even UNDP does some stuff in trade, even, you know, so there are, there are ways. Yeah. I don't know if that was helpful. Yes, that was, that was really helpful. Um, and I think it really ties in into the whole aspect of relationship building. And I feel like it, it ties in with the soft skills, which you were mentioning, Katrona, are definitely going to be very, very important. Well, they're already very important right now. And 
Um, just before uh, I jump into the Q&A box, because I can see there's quite a number of questions, um, Katrina, I was just wondering if you can also um, sort of specifically mention these soft skills. I mean, I, I often see, you know, about empathy, for example, like what are these skills and how can candidates really capture them in the way they present themselves? It's a, it's a great question and something that is, I think, not focused on enough in the broader future of work discussions. People focus a lot on tech skills, on the skills that move you from one career to another uh, and the soft skills are, are harder to define. Um, so I don't think they are well outlined anywhere. For me personally, uh, they're around communication, uh, is a big one uh, that organizations are more and more looking for. I think a lot of UN organizations are, are working hard now on opening up um, and communicating their agenda more broadly. And as they become more uh, intersectional, intersectoral, um, they have to communicate in clearer and more simple manners. So communication skills are, are top of, of that list for me. Mm -hmm management skills, project management, time management, just that practicality of getting work done, whether it's research work or whether it's delivery on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, when someone knows you can hit the ground running and manage yourself when you can manage a team, then that's, uh, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, empathy in, is, a, is a hard one to quantify, but it's really what we were talking about in terms of even putting your CV and um, and a uh, cover letter in front of someone or doing your 30 second elevator pitch, realizing that it's really about that person's needs uh, and where that person is at that point in time and how you sell yourself to them. So understanding what you're going into um, and the perspective of the, the organization that you're entering mm -hmm. is incredibly important. And that sounds soft, but there's some, some hard work that can go behind that in terms of looking at someone's LinkedIn profile, looking at where they're from, uh, researching your organization, looking at the top issues mm -hmm. that are hitting that space. And that helps you to be more, more empathetic when mm -hmm. you're dealing with someone. Um, I could keep going I'll stop. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so the, there's a question about tailoring an application. You know, is there anything that someone can do more besides just checking the company's website to, you know, to learn more about an organization? And I think this is something, I'm just responding to the person who posted this, I think this is something that has been mentioned repeatedly by George, by Katrona, and also by Rifka in terms of just checking the LinkedIn profile um, of the specific people who work in the organization or in the company that you're interested in. Um, this is something that you could definitely um, use to sort of expand um, the knowledge that you're looking out for. Um, the other question is, um, in the case of a master's program, what is the best moment to do an internship? Is it during the first or the second year? <laughs> Very specific, this one. <laughs> Like first years because we know they're, they're still going to be there next year. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, George? I did a one year master, so it wasn't so much of a, a situation for, yeah. for me personally. Um, I I am a big fan, and, and certainly with with um, the people that we bring on, um, we we even bring on undergraduates through summer programs, which. I found to be an incredibly helpful way for, for them to test out different industries and, and start to build the, their career. So I think, to be honest, I, I'm a big fan of doing it as soon as you can, um, it, because then you, you're able to test out different options before you have to sort of commit to something that might be a bit longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rifka, do you have anything to add? Okay, all right. Um, I would um, oh, add sure. a little to the first question around looking at companies. There's websites, there's LinkedIn, which is a, a huge asset looking at people who are in that company and where they've come from. But social media in general um, is incredible at the moment. Look at Twitter. Mm -hmm. Talking of empathy, put your yourself in the shoes of the person who's on that team and think about what kind of publications, what kind of public figures that person would be interested in and follow them and look at what they're talking about, what the top trends are. I think that's really a huge resource and it kind of can sink into you over time rather yeah. than just reading the website and trying to memorize what's on there. 
And I think particularly in the case of the private sector newspapers, mm -hmm. a lot of people skip that as sort of a necessary step at understanding both what's happening for the company itself is, is really important, but also the wider industry. So what are the regulatory pressures they're facing? What are the workforce challenges that they're having? Mm -hmm. All of these things can feed into a conversation that, that you have um, as and when you get there. Mm, excellent. There's a, there's a question about a virtual job as a, the first job that someone is taking. And um, this person is asking, you know, is it a bad idea to start off, you know, with a virtual job? Because then onboarding looks different. Things like mentorship, you know, can look different. Um, what do the panelists think of this? So this is a question to all of you. Rifka, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is something that we've been facing also uh, in in our office. Um, we um, also, uh, with the pandemic, we haven't been able to bring in people necessarily in person. And I think, you know, of course, there are disadvantages for not being able to be in the office um, and, you know, have coffees and informal chats. And, you know, there's a lot of of relationship building, networking and empathy that comes out through that process. But I think many, we have to accept that this is the reality of work life at the moment and the hybrid, I feel like it's definitely the way, the way it's gonna go. The way I think to, to manage this, yes, it's not ideal, but the way to manage is also to have very clear expectations and to have um, sort of rules of engagement, if you like, like have agreement with your supervisor and with your team that there will be regular check-ins. That, I mean, we have, for example, um, I think you might be connected, uh, our colleague Rico, who's an intern at the New York office, he's currently in Paris. We have daily check-ins. Uh, every day at a particular time, um, the lines of communication are open. We have a WhatsApp chat group. We have a Teams, a Microsoft Teams channel. We have, um, he can email whenever he wants. We can call if we need to, but we also have this regular check-in. Um, and, you know, something that I think, um, as an, especially if it's about an internship or, or a, first, um, a first job, you know, if you do feel that you can can you have a supervisor that you can speak to it is helpful to say can i have a weekly call one on one um that is not just about the tasks that's also about career development that's also about professional development because that's also about them helping you become um you know more valuable more efficient more um useful for the team um and it goes beyond just okay. Uh, what are the tasks for today, and what have we what have we been able to achieve, and you know, are we on track, etc. Um, it's a broader discussion. Um, so it, yes, it's not ideal, but there are ways to manage it um, uh, that can make it very fruitful. Great, Katrina and George, <laughs> do you like to add anything? Yeah, it's uh, the future, isn't it? Uh, digital work, remote work, uh, the, the task platform. We started at the beginning of the pandemic, so our team hardly met each other for the first two years that we worked together. And I think the, yeah. the big questions to ask yourself are, what's the culture of the organisation that you're going into? Is it a culture that can support that kind of remote work where, we, where you will get the kind of connections that Rupa was, uh, was mentioning mm -hmm. just now? Um, about your own needs out of the job. Uh, if it's a job where you need to, uh, you want to have that experience of sitting in a room with someone and pouring over material together and having those interactions that can only happen in person, mm -hmm. then perhaps look for a face to face job. Yeah. But with remote work comes huge opportunities for talking about digital trade in, in services. <laughs> you might be in, uh, in Asia, where I'm from, in South Africa, and be able to work for the, uh, the ITC here in Geneva, which is an opportunity that you wouldn't have otherwise, and probably a, a level of income that you may not have access to otherwise. There can be uh, great opportunities in this space. And as the world becomes more global, we're working on global teams all the time. So even before the pandemic, I've had multi-year relationships with people that I've never met in person. They can be incredibly fruitful, incredibly in detail, uh, and technology is only going to be better. So I wouldn't turn down an opportunity just because it's it's global. I would approach it with a little caution, 
uh, just because it's virtual, so I don't think it's a little caution, but uh, I think there's going to be more and more of these opportunities. Mm, right. George, your take on virtual? I, I mean, for so in our team also this in the pandemic in the first you know two years um barely um barely saw any other my teammates we were all sitting uh, on zoom team the hated webex um that, that it was you know and and they, i agree with you know, and what the, what's been said around putting those guardrails in place are really important um the other thing i would add is depending on how big the organization is that, that you're potentially joining um is the activities are they also doing that that are virtual quite often you know sort of the broader teams are doing brown bag lunches um they're doing sort of you know community events for you know raising money and and everyone's doing something differently you know the communities and organizations often have these little communities that focus on not extracurricular activities but sort of broader social missions that you can definitely be involved with and that allows you to meet people outside of just your own team and be part of the wider organization which i think is quite important mm, right um other question and I'm guessing this candidate has a PhD because they, they want to know how does a PhD help in terms of opportunity in this area, especially if it focuses on policy and development. How can anyone doing a PhD in policy and development sort of get into the trade? Well, is it is it necessary to have a PhD? Big question. Um, I I can answer from a personal perspective. I reached a career juncture and had and was considering going back to academia and uh, and doing a PhD. And so the way it was explained to me is a PhD you know, a huge amount about a tiny little thing that not so many people care about. So if you're going to do a PhD, then you need to know your tribe and you know how to do that important to um so i would have done like a fashion project and it probably would have uh, would have loved it but i mean, never advanced my career and then came along that allowed me to work with great academics <laughs> without a phd <laughs> um so so there's that but in some areas of deep reality then it's almost a must have um so it really depends on, on what you want to do right okay and maybe in the space. No, I, I think it, it depends why you're doing it, and I think that is really important point. Um, what, what's your motivation for doing it? Most jobs in the corporate sector and, and even in a lot of the international organizations don't require a PhD. Um, what I, you know, there are some areas like if you're going to the you know trade modeling, economy trade, or, or really specialized tasks where a degree of technical knowledge is required in order to do that, then it can be a really powerful addition to your CV and skill set. But if you're doing it for the sake of doing it and, and getting it at doctor uh, on your name, um, then I might question the value in, in the job market. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, the last question in the Q&A box is related to something that you also talked about. Can you hear us well? Yeah? I think there's, there's a little bit of background noise. Um, okay. Anyway, our tech team is, is on it. Um, so this question is about the dilemma of the UN system not paying attention and how that is giving other people um, these opportunities. So I think I think the candidate wants to know um, what is your what is your understanding, especially given that you work for a UN. What is your perspective on this? Is it something that should hinder someone from taking on an internship when you know that it's unpaid? Um, Hi, hi. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I understood the broad brushstrokes of the question about internships in the UN and them being un, unpaid, but I don't, I didn't hear all the details. Um, and I'm hearing myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's a bit 
dis disorienting. So, I mean, look, um, it's really weird. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so no, let me just try and forge ahead and ignore my, my own voice. Um, so I think, you know, there are, there have been pushes to try to, to address this issue of unpaid internships. Um, there are some organizations which do they pay their interns, ILO pays their interns, WIPO pays their interns. Um, and, you know, uh, some member states uh, are making funds available for, you know, their own um, citizens to be able to, to get paid internships through foundations, for instance, or through funds. And, um, and, uh, I think right now, like while these things are in motion, we still need to accept the current reality that yes, internships are unpaid. Um, I think when you enter an internship, we have to be very clear about expectations and it's not realistic to think that I'm going to do this unpaid internship and make a very big sacrifice. It's true living in Geneva or New York or even, uh, you know, even Accra, if you want to do AFCFTA, for example, um, they're not cheap places to live. Um, and if you don't have a salary and all of that, it's, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, it's, but don't start an internship. My advice would be is don't start an internship with the expe expectation that you're definitely going to get a job. Use it for the experience. Use it for the ability to, to gain networks, to learn how things are done, to to have mentors, um, to get into. Once you're in the space, you can have conversations with people, invite people for coffees, um, and uh, have also develop a network with other interns. Even now in my career, what I've seen is a lot of people um, still draw on the networks that they developed with other interns when they were interns. So really use it as part of your learning experience, an extension of your studies, an extension of almost like an, a, kind, a kind of apprenticeship. Of course, it would be great if you can get a paid job afterwards. Um, and uh, it is an unfair situation. Absolutely, I'm not gonna deny that. Um, and it entrenches uh, disparities. Um, but it is the reality that it is right now um, and, and, and use it for your advantage if you are able to take the opportunity. So it's about the, the relationships, the networks, the learning, um, asking the questions um, and uh, yeah, just seeing it as an extension of your, of your, of your academic experience. That's, that's what I would say. I don't know if I'm, I've completely addressed the question because I didn't hear it so well. So please, yes. uh, please feel free to have follow-ups. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, to the person who also asked that question, I mean, if if you would like to frame it otherwise, then you are definitely welcome to um, to add to that. I'm just going to see, see. I think there's one more question. OK, that was a comment about the sound and now it's fixed. Um, I have one uh, bonus question and this goes out to all of you. And it's about quiet quitting. <laughs> I mean, we're talking most, I'm, I'm assuming that part of our audience, if not mo most of them are part of Gen Z. And um, I think a lot of people have been uh, not victims, but they have chosen to, to quit quietly. But I want us to look at it from the perspective of transferable skills, you know? Um, so what is quiet quitting? What does it mean for transferable? transferable skills, you know, going forward. And I'm just going to explain this to our online audience. So quiet quitting basically is a concept. I think it went viral when some guy on TikTok circulated a video where he just said, you know, he's going to do the bare minimum in his workplace just because, you know, he did not feel he was being appreciated. Um, and then I don't remember who coined the term, but then it became the thing that sort of caught on. Um, but in our case, you know, we want to sort of bring it down to the level of candidates and transferable skills. Yeah. So this is a question to all of you. Yeah. Who'd like to go first? Katrina would like to ask to clarify the question in terms of what you mean by transferable skills in the context of quiet, of quiet quitting. So I mean, in the sense that a lot of people, um, a lot of um, members of the Gen Z generation, then they would be hopping from one role to the other, or um, also the concept of job security is not something that is so, so important for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can sort of 
work in a particular role, but you're performing minimal tasks and you're not really necessarily going overboard while you're planning, I don't know, your next, ex your next exit to move on to the other thing. But how, you know, how can this, how can this sort of, yeah? I think, um, so do you mind if I jump in? Go ahead. Yeah. I think there's um, a little misconception mm -hmm. around quiet quitting uh, um, in terms of rather than a, a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. it's actually reflecting a change in culture in the workplace and a change in economic situation that we're facing amongst employers. Uh, so I think when when I entered the workforce way back when, you really got this corporate culture of work is your entire life. You sacrifice everything. You throw yourself heart and soul into your career. It's a huge part of your identity, mm -hmm. um, and it encompasses you for a number of years until you hit a, a number of barriers, especially as a woman in life, which uh, which lead you to recalibrate your work life balance. Mm -hmm. Um, I think young people are cooing on now. Um, corporate careers don't necessarily offer that same fast track and reward system that they used to. They're becoming a, a little more mature, I would say, in the markets and, and uh, career progression is slowing down. Um, and this probably fits in the international organizations even better. I don't know that these same challenges transfer over. But also, I think... Uh, young people today are looking for something else from work rather than driving to deliver the profit outcomes returns that an organization is looking for. They're looking for purpose, mm -hmm. they're looking for passion and employers are looking for people to bring that purpose and passion in their jobs. Um, what employers haven't done is caught up to that in how you structure jobs and how you give people their day-to-day -day tasks. So a lot of young people find themselves doing like very dull things trying to bring their whole selves and all their passions to work and then hitting walls um, so there's a bit of an impasse in terms of uh, employers offering what can satisfy young people and young people saying well I don't actually want to work all hours of the day mm -hmm. uh, to deliver this thing which doesn't meet up with what I'm very passionate about and instead I'm going to commit my time to having work-life balance and, right. uh, and the job so I don't know um, if I'm answering the question for young people, but I think mm -hmm. the solution is to look at the culture of the organization that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think organizations are also paying a lot more attention to the voices of youth. So sessions such as uh, are being run by the Geneva Trade Platform are incredibly popular because they bring in the voices of students, they bring in uh, the, the needs and wants of a new generation coming into the workspace to a lot of organizations that are trying to understand how to keep up with a lot of rapid change and are trying to fill some quite severe skills gaps mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, so look at the organization's culture, look at the kind of work life that you want and whether the jobs you're applying to will fit in with that, speak to people who are in that uh, industry uh, and use your voice to, to influence the way the future of work will look if you have the, the opportunity to do that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a fascinating question. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, and find that there's a big corporate answer here about UI and driven purpose. And the, 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 there is all of that, which actually I found to be incredibly true. And, and a lot of the partnership are genuinely behind it. But what for me, you know, when I look at my team and, and how I'm managing the team, you know, I, I don't want people who are burnt out. Fundamentally, that is not good for the team. It's not good for the projects that we're delivering and, and it's not good for the individuals. So making sure, at least for us, that everyone has the right amount of work and they're not being overloaded and they're being able to develop those outside interests is ultimately good business sense because anything else for me is, is not the case. I would actually go one step further and not just say the organization, but coming back to the team that you're joining. Mm -hmm. For me in work, and, and I found this, if I don't like the team I'm working with, I've quit jobs because of it. For me, it, and, and it's as you're starting your career, you'll find sort of what drives your work, what you, what you find really important in the workplace. And for me, it's the people that are around me on a daily basis. Obviously during COVID, they weren't physically around me, they were 
on the other side of a screen, um, but I need to like the people that I'm working with. So unless I have that, I'm, I'm not going to be interested in. So making sure that you know what's important to you, I think is so important around um, and around your job, around your work and, and eventually your career. In terms of the, the transferable skills, I think being able to have honest conversations um, with your employers about what do you need, um, how does that work, how do you structure your different projects um, is, is something I think everyone should develop um, because there's no point just sitting there being unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, it's much better to have, have a conversation about it up front in order to try and fix it so that you're not just sitting there and go, being really angry um, and letting those resentments build up, rather trying to find a productive way to, to solve it. Excellent. And Rifka, you got the last word. <laughs> wow, pressure. No, I mean, my colleagues have, have um, raised some really important points. And I think, you know, it, it does come back to culture change and the realization that, you know, work is not going to fulfill every need that we have as, as individuals, and it shouldn't. Um, I think we can learn a lot from what uh, companies have done, for instance, in the creative space, um, for example, advertising agencies giving room to their creative types to not just work on their projects um, for, you know, from their pay, paying clients, but give, taking time to be able to also then um, work on personal projects, personal development um, that, that then uh, helps to contribute to the creativity of the individual um, and hopefully then, you know, is an incentive to stay, an incentive to create. I think in the public sector and in international organizations, we're much slower at this. Um, at ITC, we've been um, trying to do qu quite good stuff here. There's, um, you, you know, you have to, like personal development, skills development is part of, um, you know, every, every staff member uh, can take the time, they can ask for more time. Um, there's also, you know, flexible working arrangements, um, work, uh, work life balance issues, you know, when it comes to family and, um, we, uh, but, you know, I think, um, you know, the panel is right that it, it also comes down to, to having those tough conversations. Um, the power dynamics is different though. We have to, we call a spade a spade, you know, when you're talking to your supervisor, it may not be the easiest thing to do. It, it's hard calling these things out, especially when you're you're starting your career. Um, and I'm I'm glad that this younger generation is listening to their kind of gut and saying, "This is not working for me. I'm gonna try and find a, a better fit," and not just and, and taking care of mental health um, because uh, without that. You know what's what's the point in having a workforce that's burnt out and and it's not um that's uh that's not taking care of themselves as well so also for the organization um and uh yeah so i think we have some catch-up to do um let's not think we're going to to um to answer all of our our needs as human beings with the workforce but let's look look after our people and um and, and invest in them and you know there's a whole other set of questions here which we didn't touch on which is issues of for, for example diversity and inclusion issues um around that with a, a lot of the the quiet quitting was also linked to to issues of, of not being able, not fitting in or not being uh, um you know those needs not being met so uh, that's a whole other kettle of fish yeah yeah absolutely and I'm, I'm glad you actually uh raised that um because i mean as 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 a black woman myself um and i hear from other younger black women um who are really struggling to sort of um get into the job market for example in geneva and they're self-sponsored students and i think for me where that sort of intersects is a lot of them are really focused also on getting opportunities in, within the UN system, but then, you know, half, sometimes the opportunities are not paid and then that kind of poses a challenge. Um, but, um, you know, in, in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion, you know, um, Katrona, do you see that as, I know a lot of companies are sort of making sure that this is a training that they're doing, but often it feels like it's a, it's a check 
you know, just a box to, to tick. <laughs> but is it really going deep? Is it percolating? And I think it really depends on the, the context, the companies and the right. individuals that you're working with. Um, I ethnic minority female <laughs> face, uh, face hurdles in, in our careers. It's always a little bit trickier, but uh, I mean, disadvantage can come in, in many forms, mm. uh, whether it's the ability to take an unpaid internship or whether it's being in the, uh, the in-group. One of my toughest cultural challenges was in, in London, working in a, a corporate strategy practice where everyone was talking about crickets. <laughs> I was like, how do I get in this gang? I'm reading the cricket section, the sports section of the news every day, yeah. trying to learn cricket rules. So there, there's always these hurdles. Uh, you can do what you can as an individual, but um, I think the, the change comes from the top and it's it's coming. Not fast enough, unfortunately. Right. George, you were nodding your head like, no, you're not really seeing a lot of change per se. No, I think th there is a huge amount of change. Um, my team, for instance, incredibly diverse, both from um, a background and also gender perspective. And, and that's something that we're really proud of. It's also benefited the business because it brings in more views and, and something that we're incredibly proud of. Um, broad, more broadly in EY, which is where I work, you know, there's still more work to do. The, the, the senior leadership has acknowledged that. And it's something that is actively what being worked on, not just from a HR perspective, but also who's getting recommended to be brought into the business as well, um, changing a lot of the social constructs around how we hire and who we hire that, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, but it's it's not as good as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Rivka, uh, can you wrap it up for us uh, in a minute? Because I know that you're also mentoring quite a number of women and I'm wondering is this you know one of the ways that you're dealing with this in terms of just supporting these young women to get into the trade world? Uh, yeah absolutely I mean I've benefited from um, from mentorship my my entire life uh, my, my entire career and um, I mentioned to you that uh, the person who was my mentor when I started as an intern back in 2003 is still one of my mentors today. Um, and I think, you know, this is, it, it is um, really an important uh, relationship. And I think the value that I get from it is, and the approach that, you know, you try to take is, it's not a transactional relationship. When you look for mentors, don't think about, oh, I'm going to get them to be my mentor so they'll hire me one day. Um, it really is about having a sounding board. Um, and, you know, going to this point about diversity and inclusion, um, you know, as a black woman in this this trade world, it, it has it hasn't always been easy. Um, and I, I really do uh, want to share this kind of perspective with other young people to see, I still consider myself young, so <laughs> to see, um, to be able to, to, you know, hear where they're at, you know, help guide if if they're open to that, because you know, not everybody what's feels that they need that or whatever. But I I think um, mentorship is important, and I I know that people even even uh, C suite executive directors in organisations they still have mentors because you can always you know it's valuable to have a perspective of people who've been through experiences. Um, and who are not who don't have a vested interest in the outcome of your decisions they're not your family members they're not your supervisors they're not your direct colleagues um, and they can give you a, a perspective that you may not have thought of so i would recommend um, mentorship to uh to people on this call and it's something that you know for me i have a suite of them so <laughs> women men uh very diverse backgrounds, um, countries, and uh, I, I still, you know, I still call on them now, and and I and I still will until I retire and beyond. So, um, uh, yeah, definitely part of the, the package when you think about, you know, your studies, your internships, your mentors, um, definitely helps in in getting um, on this path. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank each and every one of you for setting the time aside today to be present here and to be present for this hour and to just dedicate your time and your wisdom 
and we are going to call it a day here. Um, thank you everyone who joined. Thank you for your participation, for the questions that you also posed to our speakers. And well, stay tuned for the next session. It's going to be specifically on trade law. Um, so yeah, that's going to be coming up at 4 p.m. Thank you very much. That's it from us. Mm -hmm.